All right, we'll go ahead and get started since we have a few introductory slides. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Michelle Pilati. I am the project director for the Academic Senate for California Community College's Open Educational Resources Initiative. We're really glad to have you here today. Um, a few little housekeeping things before we get started. Um, just a reminder, your organizing committee, you probably have seen us throughout these different sessions. We put together the program and we're really happy um, to have you all here and um, looking, happy, looking forward to talking to you after um, this session. Thank you to our sponsors that make this all um, worthwhile and possible, uh, particularly 20 Million Minds from the Michelson Foundation, as um, who is one of our sponsors um, and really helps to make this all, all possible. Um, and the small fees that we get cover, help to cover the cost of this. And I think more importantly, enable us to offer live captioning. We're pleased to be able to do that and hope that that has been um, benefiting the folks that are using those resources. Uh, Zoom basics, um, you're probably used to all this now. Be sure to mute yourself if you're not muted. We encourage you to use the chat. We do plan to have time for questions and answers at the end, so please raise your hand and unmute, unmute when you're called upon. All our sessions will be recorded and they'll be available on the Zoom platforms, uh, Zoom events platform for six months after the event and you'll be notified when they are available. The general sessions, our keynotes and system updates, uh, will be available on the our OER YouTube channel at tinyurl.com forward slash Cal OER archive. And so if you're curious about um, what's happened over the past couple of years, you can head there to see what, um, what we learned about the systems then. An important program note, we had a um, presenter who had a, um, a, an emergency at the last minute. And so the 3.30 p.m. to 4.15 session, Open Doors to Data Science has been canceled, but we are working with the presenter to make a recorded presentation available. And you, you may have noticed on the program um, you, you could not actually join that, and this is why. So we are here now for California Higher Education System updates. Again, this is something that we have done um, every year. Um, bringing in a representative from each of the system, public systems of higher education in California to talk about what's been happening in their system in the OER ZT space over the past year. Today, we have uh, Danny Brecker Cook is joining us. She's from the University of California, San Diego, um, and the UC Common Knowledge Group on OER, and you will learn what exactly that means. She is the Associate University Librarian for Learning and User Experience at UC San Diego. Um, and she has worked on affordability issues at both UC Riverside and UC San Diego. Returning from CSU again is Leslie Kennedy from CSU Affordable Learning Solutions. Um, and then Rebecca Ron O'Shaughnessy will be joining us um, to speak about the California Community Colleges. Um, and if by chance she doesn't make it, um, Chad is set to step in for her on the 0.1%, I think she said, chance that she doesn't make it. Uh, so welcome everyone. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing and um, we'll get the slides up for Danny. Hi, Michelle. Uh, Danny actually just messaged and said that there's a fire alarm happening at her campus. So she had to step out momentarily. Um, if we can have Leslie kick us off, that would be great. Oh, that's fine with me. I'm looking for my slides really fast. Uh, where have my slides? So yes, uh, if that's what you want to do, we would like to do, Michelle. I don't hear anything. Yes, please, Leslie. Okay. So let's see. Will my thing pick up our slides? Are you seeing anything on my screen? Are you seeing Not my yet. slides? Not yet. Yeah, there's something weird. Hmm, we might have some issues here. We're just talking about Zoom issues. <laughs> um, I have sharing on, but it's not sharing. It doesn't seem to be sharing. Could someone turn, could, Selena, could you kick me out of sharing, please? I can try. It's not saying that you are sharing. Oh, okay. All right. Let me just try one more time. It's not finding, there we go. All right. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you all. Thanks for being here. Uh, again, this afternoon, it's been an incredible group of sessions that I've been able to see through this present, through this conference, and I'm trying to minimize screens as I, I can't talk and shoot gum. 
And let's see where the presentation thing, but oh, well, we'll leave it as this. Uh, so what I'm here to do is tell you a little bit about what's happening in, in the California State University System, the largest four-year comprehensive university system in the country. And um, our students are, 50% um, of our students uh, transfer from the community colleges of California. So we have a very strong intersegmental connection with um, with the CCs and then also a strong connection with a lot of uh, faculty come out of the UCs and then also um, uh, work in two, both places a lot of the time. So a lot of connections between our three systems and uh, it's a big emphasis actually right now for the CSU. But just in general, uh, I'm the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Academic Technology Services, which encompasses a lot of different areas at the system level. And I'm not going to go through them because that'll just make your head go back or turn it around. So I'll just focus on affordable learning solutions. And this is the system-wide initiative to help uh, the campuses um, and the faculty on our campuses locate and adopt, uh, uh, become more aware and adopt um, uh, low cost or zero cost materials um, in order to uh, provide an inclusive, equitable, and effective learning environment for them. And that's a huge uh, issue for our students. Um, our students are very much like all of your students, so I'm not going to get into that specifically, but um, providing that kind of a learning environment is is utmost uh, a priority for the CSU. And then from the instructor's perspective, in order to be able to be as responsive pedagogically as possible, um, the tools such as open educational resources do allow for um, allow for flexibility and um, re reflective and focused student learning as much as possible. And so we emphasize that and support that 100%. Our website is this, the als.calstate.edu. Leslie, uh, yep. I want to let you know you're showing, okay, you're showing a slide 13. Is that what you wanted to? Yeah. Okay. I'm at the bottom of a bunch of slides that were sent to me and I just added two more. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Sure. Okay, so, oh, here's the chat. The chat went to the top. So here's our, um, here we go. our overall website. I don't have screenshots of it. I figured if you wanted to peruse that you could take a look. So affordable learning solutions, we um, use the word ALS a lot for that. And, um, I wanted to give you a quick overview of what we're ha what's happening on our campuses, on the 23 campuses, and how we manage our program and some of the other areas that we're involved in collaborating with you all as well. So it's a very autonomous program. First of all, we're funded from lottery funds. We get about 300000 a year to distribute to... Um, uh, well, it's about 250 actually a year to distribute across 23 institutions. So about every campus can apply for 10 to $15,000 to run their affordable learning solutions initiative. It's not much. So we work with very little to create great things. Um, so very autonomous. Uh, and as I said, but all of our campuses have their own culture. So they they will name their programs. We've got a acronym with uh, that's called CALM, C-A-L-M. It's the Cougars Affordable Learning Materials Program at, at Cal State San Marcos. So they are the Cougars. They have used CALM now for years, and so they use it as a verb, calming down their courses to lower the cost of the materials is to calm down their courses. Um, Cal State LA uses SCORE. Um, that's the Scholarly Communication Open Resources e-learning. That's how they brand their affordable learning. So again, I'm showing the autonomy here. Fresno has a Be a Hero campaign. And uh, Fullerton, for example, has the Open Fullerton campaign. So we provide the funding to the campuses and then they, um, and then they uh, will, oops, gosh, I just pulled something off the screen, I think. They will then uh, make it their own. Where's my PowerPoint? Sorry about that, everybody. So um, on that note, with the funding comes a requirement or expectations that the campuses create a committee um, of stakeholders that has to include um, faculty, professional development office, students with disabilities office, bookstore, 
um, stu a student if possible. It's hard, always hard to get students. And then possibly a department coordinator. These people are, we believe and know that these are all very involved in the ALS solution and uh, on a campus. So that group designates a coordinator and then those that group is the one that requests the funding based on the criteria that we ask them to uh, uh, check uh, develop into their re their 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 model or their strategic plan, and that includes creating a um, a, a representative web page and um, uh, 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 reports. They have to turn in two reports a year. And then um, facilitate a, a, a face. A, um, sorry, I'm trying to juggle too many things right now. Uh, the emails are popping. I should turn the emails off. Anyway, um, uh, facilitate a recognition ceremony for the faculty who have participated in um, calming down their courses or reducing the course uh, costs for their students by adopting either library materials or OER, or in some cases, low cost materials as well. And then also, um, uh, providing a or attending our annual meeting. We have an annual meeting every year where we meet face to face and we share best practices and and bring in speakers that are um, doing some creative things on other at other institutions in addition to the CSU. Um, this past year, Chad, who's here today, and uh, Michelle uh, participated in our annual meeting, which we really appreciated uh, in and also reflecting our collaborative environment as much as possible. So my office facilitates a few things. So we provide resources in regards to, um, we, we uh, obviously fund the campuses. We uh, facilitate monthly webinars every month. Uh, we have every third Thursday, uh, our, our community comes together and we have speakers and or campuses sharing some solutions that are working really well for them and for their faculty or students. And so that's been ongoing for years. In fact, for a while there, I could I would see some people from the community colleges attending. So I'll make sure I'll let you all know when that is in case anybody is interested in participating in that as well. And then um, we also are the, the liaison to the legislature and the governor's office uh, whenever assembly bills are, uh, or Senate bills are created and or required for us to implement. And then also the governor's compact, which I'll tell you a little bit about at the end of this slide. So we do a lot from my end and then, but the campuses do the bulk of the work. Um, Shelly, who's on the call, I believe, um, is one of our coordinators at Fullerton or what, the coordinator at Fullerton. And that's a huge campus of 40,000 students or more. And so that's a huge job for a single coordinator and that committee. But they uh, have lifted a lot of boats through this process and they're doing an amazing job. And so are our coordinators on all our campuses. Um, so the creative and innovative strategies I thought I would go over really quickly. Um, one of them is... Uh, the libraries coordinating with the bookstores to get the list of books that the faculty have selected for the next semester. And then they take some of our funding to pay a student or a staff member to go through all of their library collections to see if they're, those eBooks or any kind types of materials are already in the massive amounts of collections that we uh, provide to the system. And so that's been an, a very successful strategy. So it's the sharing of libraries and e-textbook lists, we call it. And uh, that's been a great way to lower costs for students when the faculty are then made aware of the fact that their textbook is actually available in the library uh, um, databases. Just, yeah, that, just like the end. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so then... Um, those are, uh, uh, that's a very successful program and we encourage as much as possible to do that. And one of the strategies back to the bookstores that we facilitate at the CO, Chancellor's Office, is um, annual meetings with all of the bookstores. They all attend, 23 of the directors come. And then we have uh, discussions about supporting o uh, affordable learning solutions and they're all in, in many, many ways. And so we have Follett stores, we have Barnes and Noble stores, and then we have independent stores. All of them have different strategies on 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 how they work uh, corporate wise, um, but they are 
uh, all basically supporting, they're there to support the university. And so they are very much a part of our affordable learning solutions initiatives and um, provide scholarships to students, et cetera, et cetera. The scholarships for books and course materials, et cetera. So that's where the library and the stores um, work together as much as possible. Some campuses, it works better than others. Again, as I mentioned earlier, we have a lot of camp varied campus cultures. The CSU is very diverse in our cultures as well as just being a very diverse institution. Um, so other strategies we've seen is adopting OER across disciplines and across departments. And so encouraging our funding and the models that the campus groups are, are facilitating is to find departments that might be open to adopting, let's say an open stacks book across all their chemistry 100 courses, and then providing them funding for that process or helping another camp uh, department that's creating their own OER and helping to supplement some of the time for the faculty to do that work. So we see stipends, we see, um, those types of collaboration of, of ho hoping that the more and more adoption of OER is happening um, across the various disciplines, especially in the GE level courses, because uh, we teach lots of GE. And by the way, we're going to benefit from your uh, the community college 115 million that you received from the state and all the, the materials and, and, uh, and open OER course materials that you are creating for the for your courses, we will also benefit from. Them. In fact, we all implemented ethnic studies together at the same time, and the books that have been created, the e-textbooks, the OER that have been created through you all, through the community colleges, have been shared with our um, um, campus uh, ethnic studies or uh, courses and faculty and departments. And so um, there have been adoptions as a result of that as well, which is exciting to see. So what other collaborative activities do we see? We have uh, some campuses hiring faculty fellows or ambassadors to work in their disciplines or in their divisions to help um, talk about the advantages and, and the reasons why one would um, select an OER and then or, and or create an OER to meet their teaching and, and needs. So that's uh, active at Dominguez Hills and at East Bay. Um, we have also a lot of collaboration happening with, between our systems, um, go, go, reaching back all the way to 2012, two Senate bills were passed that created, one of them created a fac, a intersegmental faculty group that then worked together to create coolfored.org. And that was another Senate bill. And coolfored.org is a place where we have cataloged uh, initially based on the requirements of those Senate bills, OER for the uh, top or the top GE disciplines out there. And, um, and we got, we had to, it was required that we had those books reviewed by faculty as well. So that framework is there. And then another assembly bill came along with additional funding. And between our systems, we all added more materials there. And coolfored.org is now the place where the, the, in the legislature, legislation for the 115 million the community colleges received is where those document, um, those uh, archives or artifacts that are being created will be cataloged as well. So Chad Funk here, who's on the call, Michelle Pilati and James GG and our team have been meeting to um, discuss the best way to facilitate that. And we're in the process of doing that right now. So we really appreciate and, and uh, uh, enjoy our intersegmental collaboration that we have between our systems and in support of our students in the state of California for their future uh, successes. And then professional development, we see uh, lots of other activities around faculty uh, training. We, one of the campus created, campuses created a Canvas course on learning more about zero and uh, cost materials. The Sac State has a faculty learning community. Um, um, Santa Barbara is providing stipends to support faculty adoption. And Fullerton's got a, um, a, a strong focus on the zero cost course materials, also known as ZCCM. 
initiative, which is also a Senate bill 1359 that requires all of us to mark our zero cost course materials in our catalogs for our students. So there's um, they're trying to increase the offerings of those at Fullerton. And so they that's part of their strategy to engage faculty in adoption of OER. So that's usually in the found in professional development. There's lots of uh, types of activities happening there. And it's really about the campus is getting to know the faculty, the interested faculty, and then hoping to then um, spread the word amongst the disciplines to um, engage uh, more and more faculty to adopt OER for the students' benefits. And then research, we have several campuses doing um, research projects around uh, uh, how is it, uh, how is OER adoption assisting students in high impact courses? And um, those are, courses with DFW rates, which are pretty high as well. And then how are the success rates um, changing in those courses or uh, being affected in those courses by the adoption of zero cost materials? Um, we also have some research out of uh, Bakersfield in regards to uh, why we should be using more retention, uh, more um, adoption policies of OER in our retention tenure promotion review. Um, and so that's uh, also been published by the um, other organizations as well. Um, we have several, two campuses that I can think of actually that have our offering of several um, four year zero cost course material degrees. Um, and so um, that's pretty exciting, but, um, and it's very difficult to implement in a four year institution. Uh, even what uh, that's something that Cable Green mentioned yesterday in his keynote, how it's more difficult as we move into the four year levels to adopt OER, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, we're very proud and excited about those institutions that's Channel Islands and Bakersfield as well that are doing that and have done it successfully for quite a long time. So lots of activities happening on the campuses. Um, uh, and then if you'd like to see some showcases of faculty adoptions, we have them on the Cool for Ed website. The link is there on the um, on the slide. I'll take it, I'll make a copy of it for you and put it in the chat. And that is um, uh, meant to help faculty see their peers adopting OER and the successes and the challenges that they've experienced. And for them to also see, for faculty to see uh, examples of um, uh, their disciplines adopting OER as successfully as well. Um, so that is uh, constantly being updated by the CSU at this point uh, because we continue to maintain cool4ed.org. Uh, but many of those courses are GE level courses and might tell a story that might be interesting to all faculty in your pro, in your um, institutions as well. And last but not least, um, in 2021, uh, let's say 21, the governor released a compact for our campuses and our systems, I should say, uh, and our system compact includes a section on affordability and uh, one piece of it is requiring the CSU to show $150 million course material savings for this, our students by 2025. Um, that's a, a challenge, has been a challenging experience, but we feel confident that we're going to be able to meet those numbers next year. And so that's been a big focus and driver for all of our coordinators and our campuses and the work they've been doing to be able to show uh, that savings. So that's a quick overview of what's happening in the CSU. We continue to uh, look forward and be adjusting to the changing times in regards to our dropping or decreasing budgets, our decreasing enrollments, and also trying to support our faculty who are doing more with less. And so the more we can help them by sustaining and, and supplying resources for them to be successful adopters of zero cost course materials, the better it will be for our students. Um, so that's our my quick overview of what we're doing in the Affordable Learning Solutions Initiative in the CSU. Um, I wanted to give Shelly, I know that you hadn't planned to do this, any chance, any idea, an opportunity to say something as a coordinator. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'll turn my camera on for a sec. Let, well, I think you did a great Great job showcasing. We have such, as you said, diversity across the CSUs. 
um, that we're all doing different things. But one of the best things about being coordinators is we have monthly meetings. We have um, a yearly retreat that the, CA, uh, the chancellor's office supports. So we have a great group of fellow people to interact with and to learn from, and that makes a big difference. Great, yeah, thank you, Shelley. A tall order for such a large institution at Fullerton. So many of you have such large institutions as well. So I applaud all the work you all do. So thank you very much, and I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much, Leslie. We'll transition over to Danny now. All right, hi everyone. Um, nice to be with you. Um, thanks so much for sharing my slides, Selena. Um, so my apologies uh, for the fire alarm delay. Uh, of course, we've had no fire alarm all summer until right now. Um, so that'll teach me to come into the office to give a presentation, I guess. Um, so hopefully you all can hear me okay. Um, I'm here to give the update from the University of California. Um, I'm the Associate University Librarian for Learning and User Experience at the UC San Diego Library. So I work primarily with our public services and IT folks, um, as well as with other student success focused units on campus. Um, I'm also the co-convener of the OER Common Knowledge Group, which is why I'm here. So common knowledge groups within the UC libraries are kind of communities of practice um, around a certain topic. So uh, folks who get together across all 10 campuses within the system to talk and further um, knowledge, as in the name, um, on a particular area. The OER Common Knowledge Group is one of our newest. Um, it began right before the pandemic um, from uh, Merced was the one to set it up. Um, and I became the co-convener, I think three years ago. Um, so we meet on a quarterly basis to talk about the work that we're doing on all of our campuses. Um, all right, next slide, please. Okay, um, so there is some work happening at the system-wide level, um, and I'm gonna talk about that first. Um, so there was a task force um, around open educational resources that was um, put together across all 10 campuses, of, 10 campuses of the UC system in response to that very same governor's compact from 2022, um, which asked the UCs to work on bringing down the costs of non-tuition related items, including textbooks. Um, so this group got together and did a landscape review um, of all the things that were happening across the UC system, um, identified exemplar programs, both within and without the UC system, um, and surveyed academic senates on their feelings about OER and affordability affordability. Um, they returned their report um, in 2023, and they proposed three different tiers of funding and approaches, all of which would serve the whole UC system. Um, so some kind of centralized office, I think similar to what y'all are doing in the CSUs um, with various levels of support. Um, with uh, everything that's happening in the UC system, it appears that this is currently on pause. So President Drake um, announced that he's leaving. Uh, obviously Governor Newsom is about to term out. Um, so we're not really sure where this project is going, but there is a lot of energy and interest across the UC system to do something together because um, there are so many economies of scale that we could um, employ, um, as well as this is a significant need for our students at every single campus to have more affordable course materials. So next slide, please. All right, on the other hand, student activism is uh, is going really well. So um, the CalPERG chapters continue to be strong advocates for OER usage and creation um, on every campus, I believe. Um, they are having faculty um, sign petitions, et cetera, for affordable course materials, and also um, asking them to commit to using OER um, within their courses. Um, recently, Generation Up, which is another student advocacy group at Berkeley, San Diego, and UCLA, received one of those Michelson uh, 20 Million Minds grants for their OER-related advocacy work. I believe that really will kick off this fall. Um, so we're looking forward to um, learning more about the project that they're working on and, and hopefully working alongside them and, and helping to make some movement across the system. Next slide, please. 
All right, so um, all that being said, most of the work continues to happen on the individual campuses. Um, so I'll take us on a tour of the UC campuses from north to south, um, although we won't visit San Francisco today, um, to share a little bit about the variety of projects that are happening um, on all of these campuses. So next slide, please. Okay, so we're gonna start with Davis, um, which is one of our most active campuses, as I'm sure y'all know, and I saw we have some Davis librarians here in the audience. So um, please feel free to, to jump in at any, any time. So um, their uh, OER program is called the Aggie Open Program um, and has been building over the past several years. Um, so one of the cornerstones of that program is the, uh, the Aggie Open Fellows pilot program, um, which is a relatively new program. It's co-funded by LibreText and the library, and it gives awards to faculty and instructors who are teaching undergraduates to either adopt or adapt openly licensed course materials. Um, one of the really cool things that they did as part of this project was create an online Canvas course for instructors, and we've been talking a little bit in our common knowledge group about making that available across the UCs for more campuses to take advantage of. Um, so it's a really great program. Um, it's really, I think, helpful and supportive of course instructors um, and is one of the largest grant programs that's uh, available within the UC. Also around Open Education Week, they have an invited speaker series. Um, they open that up to all 10 UC campuses and I think beyond for folks who would like to come. Um, that uh, occurred again this past year. And then they're part of the Open Textbook Review Program, um, which offers faculty $250 for reviewing an open textbook in the Open Textbook Library. Um, yeah, thanks, Elise. Thanks for putting your, your, um, your link there in the chat. Um, Meanwhile, uh, as again, I'm sure you all know, um, Davis was one of the first campuses to have a equitable access program um, that is continuing this year. Um, and it, it looks to be $169 per quarter. So lower than I believe it's been in the past. There's a textbook grant program um, that is also um, uh, giving out a, about a million dollars last year. Um, Yes, and Katie, I totally hear you. Um, and I think that this is part of the picture for affordability on many of the UC campuses. So I'm not gonna take a position, but I will report out on what I know about these different programs. So thank you. All right, let's go to our next slide. Um, Santa Cruz recently fired, oh, one second. We got a trash can going by me. Um, okay, um, so Santa Cruz hired the first OER librarian within the system. Um, so this is Sarah Hare, who is the co-convener now of the OER CKG. Um, the position was funded directly from student success funds. Um, so hopefully this is a model that other campuses will be able to follow. Her role is to focus entirely on building capacity for OER. Um, she recently completed a listening tour of students and course instructors about OER um, that kind of highlighted the opportunities and also where there is some local um, questions about how OER can work. Um, and uh, we're really looking forward to uh, hearing more about the outcome of that tour and um, the programs that, that they are developing. Um, there is also a textbook access program through the educational opportunity programs on the Santa Cruz campus, which provides funds for students to purchase textbooks. Um, all right, next slide, please. All right, Berkeley um, is one of the campuses that has the most active press books initiative, so publishing for faculty. Um, they do not currently have a grant program, um, but uh, as you all know, Pressbooks is a great tool for um, individual faculty to publish, and Berkeley has put most of their energies in that direction. All right, next slide, please. All right, over to Merced. I saw some Merced colleagues here too. Um, so they have a zero cost or low cost course materials grant program, um, which is through their Scholar Transformational Impact Fund. Um, so for course instructors who move their course to zero cost or low cost course materials. Um, they get 
some money, and then they also work with a consultation team that includes a librarian, a bookstore administrator, and an instructional specialist and designer or designer. So um, this is also relatively unique within the UC system um, of having that three-part support system um, as part of the grant program. Um, so this is a relatively new program as well. And um, yeah, Sarah, definitely, if you want to add anything in the chat, please do. All right, next slide, please. Uh, Santa Barbara does not have a specific OER librarian, but uh, Angela Chicoero does a lot of work in the OER space and was a Spark Fellow a few years ago. So her report on identifying OER needs in high enrollment courses is available through the Spark website um, and um, has kind of laid the groundwork for doing this work at uh, Santa Barbara. They do also have an open and affordable course materials committee. Um, yeah, thanks, Elise, about uh, reserves and talk about that in just a second. Um, they recently completed an environmental scan on programming related to open and affordable resources for teaching, um, and then we'll be building on that program from there. Um, yeah, to Elisa's point, um, every campus in the UC system does have course reserves, um, which are textbooks available for checkout through the library, um, or uh, in some cases, films, et cetera, other, any kind of course materials that are required. Um, it's a great program, but very hard to scale, especially in times of uh, budget constriction, which we are in. Uh, all right, next slide, please. All right, UCLA, uh, I believe this was the first campus to have an affordable course materials initiative, um, which continues to this day. So a grant program for course instructors who uh, are looking to transition their course to an OER. They also have a uh, new equitable access program um, that will be debuting this fall. There's a lot of conversation on that campus about it. Um, and then this past Open Education Week, they held a workshop focusing on publishing student work as OER. Um, so kind of a, a interesting um, focus that is not the case on every campus and definitely something that we all benefit from learning more about. All right, next slide, please. Uh, going to Riverside, uh, I saw some Riverside camp uh, colleagues here as well. Um, so uh, I think the the focus on affordability at Riverside right now is in the technology space. So uh, I have a link here to their Loan to Learn program, which is providing um, laptops and um, other devices for students to be able to access their different materials. Um, previously, there was an affordable course materials initiative, but I believe that is currently paused. Ah, awesome. Thank you, Tiffany. So there is going to be a new position at Riverside as well. That's really exciting new, uh, as well. Okay, last slide. Oh, not last slide, Irvine. Um, so one of the major examples coming out of Irvine is Open Chem. Um, so there are um, on all campuses, lots of individual faculty and departments who are developing um, OER. And they also have an affordable course materials grant um, and uh, work closely with their partners across campus. Um, this is the primary way that the UC campuses are, are approaching this problem, um, as you can tell. So um, small grants for to incentivize faculty to make this transition. Okay, for real, the last slide. So here at UC San Diego, we have an affordable learning and financial support group um, as part of our executive vice, vice chancellor's collective impact project, which um, brings together partners from all different areas of campus who have different expertise so that we can work together on these big hairy problems. Um, the affordable learning and financial support group was the first one to get off the ground. Um, we conducted a survey on student experiences with course materials in 2021 and did some faculty focus groups. Um, we identified the need for additional labor and funding to support development of OER. Um, and we are in a pause moment on that too. Um, there is a technology access working group that's part of this financial support and affordable learning uh, collective impact group, um, currently focused on how to make uh, laptops available to students. Um, and we recently uh, put together a team of folks in the teaching and learning commons, the bookstore and the library to prioritize material access for courses that have high, e high need, so those with high DFW rates, um, to work proactively with those course faculty. Um, 
we do not have a grant program currently at UC San Diego, um, although we aspire to have one. Um, all right, so I think that wraps up our tour of the UC system. So thank you all so much and look forward to having a conversation at the end. Thank you, Danny. Um, and we absolutely understand the issues that can happen between technology and all the things in the environment that can interfere. And um, Rebecca is now with us. And so um, Selena will be pulling up her slides. So welcome, Rebecca. Glad you made it. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Rebecca Ron O'Shaughnessy. I'm the Vice Chancellor for uh, Student Services at the California Community College's Chancellor's Office. Uh, so nice to be here with you again this year. This is, I think I've been with the Chancellor's Office for almost four years and I this is my third time, I think, at the OER conference. So I feel very much this sense of continuity with this group. So um, it's been quite a year for us at the California Community Colleges and I'm excited to kind of provide some high level overview of what's going on. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, visual might be a repeat for many of you, but I think it's important to keep in mind of our unique governance structure as you see how we move the needle forward as a system and how partnership with colleges and organizations like ASCCC, OERI are tremendously critical for us to actually move things forward. Uh, this slide needs update, but we currently serve 2 million students every year. I'm so glad to see the new data coming in. So uh, definitely seeing the enrollment increase there. Uh, we do so through our 116 colleges in uh, 73 districts uh, and they with, lo with locally elected board of trustees. So really the chancellor's office is, we have our own uh, uh, board of governors and then what we're doing is really uh, to maintain and continue uh, local autonomy and control in the community in the administration of the community colleges. So what we do a lot is really thinking about state level conditions. So creating strategic framework, policies and regulations and direct funding and provide TA and field guidance to really support local implementations of uh, important initiatives like burden free ZTC OER. Uh, next slide, please. So another kind of general framing slide here, uh, Vision 2030 was launched late last year uh, with our new uh, chancellor, Sonia Christian, as our really action framework that's future focused and very explicit about the barriers we face in our effort to transform. And then also the resources that are necessary to reach these important goals. So specifically Vision 2030 focuses on three strategic goals, equity and success, access and support. So really thinking about what we can do to really uh, move the needles in these areas. Again, I think uh, this whole, uh, which, you know, I, I, I will continue to explain later on, but like burden-free ZTC OER really plays a critical role in, uh, in really, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of seeing fundamentally change how we deliver our services to our students. Um, and then we also on the right side have kind of the strategic directions and those are kind of the, um, you know, the what we are mobilizing system around. So there are uh, many activities behind these directions, but that's kind of the focus areas for our system right now. Uh, next slide, please. So one more slide around Vision 2030. So critically, when we think about the community college's role, we really want to expand the canopy of higher education, right, to all Californians who can benefit from higher education. And we realize that we have to bring colleges to students rather than waiting for students to come, right? So here are some of the special student populations that we want to focus in on. And I think the goal there are twofold. One is really thinking about these students and think about how to serve these students better. But also, more importantly, is how do we reimagine our structure to deliver services to these students and then really uh, equitably, right, to all the student populations across the board? Because we know our system is really set up for one type of student. So how do we be more nimble, be more flexible? And affordability comes up over and over again, right, to really be able to deliver services uh, to students, uh, you know, more effectively. Next slide. So now turning our attention to the why, right? So on the left is really a student quote, um, and we will share uh, the slides later so you guys will see all the things, but it really highlights the need for burden-free access to the required instructional materials when learning happens, right? So that just-in-time delivery of materials accompanying, right, the, the teaching is critical for the learning experience. And that speaks to the need of addressing costs 
also speaking to the need to address uh, the burdens associated with either getting cost-effective instructional materials or getting the sufficient support to pay for the instructional materials in general. So the only way to go about that, if you think about that currently, the burdens are resting with individual students, right? So the only way to go about it from a system level is to then create a coordinated comprehensive approach. So then we as a system can, can bear, can shoulder some of these individual burdens. So the students don't have to worry about that. They can focus more on learning. Uh, next slide, please. So that's really has been the goal of this movement, right? What we're looking at is, you know, under Vision 2030, we're really thinking about the importance of burden-free access for our students, right? But then at the same time, we know OER is not new, right? All of you have been working in the, on this for decades. So really, you know, a lot of the grassroots uh, efforts are happening across the system, uh, uh, you know, within the community colleges, but has been kind of uh, one-offs, right? So how do we combine all of that into an effective strategic framework and make sure that it's aligned to our system level priorities and make sure it's a college level priority, right? And then ZTC, ZTC program is a great momentum generation point, right? The, the system received historic investment in this area. So what we're really thinking about is putting all these pieces together and supercharge it and make sure, right, at the end of the day, we create that burden-free experience for our students. So then they have it and burden-free burn access for our students. So then they uh, have the required instructional materials when they need the materials, right, to, to engage in the learning experience. Next slide, please. So I'll break it down a little bit of like how uh, the different components of, of, the, uh, of this framework. So it really, uh, uh, from a system level, it starts with this burden-free instructional material task force, which the, uh, the chancellor's office launched in partnership with key stakeholders um, uh, in January of last year. And uh, we were so fortunate to have uh, co-chairs, and one of the co-chairs is Michelle, the other one, um, uh, James Todd, who was the uh, student services, uh, chief student services officer rep, right, to really uh, partner with system uh, stakeholders to think about what burden-free experience should look like for the task force. And we have a QR code there. Um, any one of you who's interested in reading the full report, it's available there. But some of those key recommendations really including um, one, alignment of system commitments and local goals. So everyone understanding where we need to go, right? And then tracking to really support that uh, continuous improvement cycle. And then also exploring regulatory options, right? Across the system to see if there are any barriers to prevent us from moving that forward. And then we also fully understand the importance of data infrastructure, right? To engaging in that understanding and learning. So the investment there. Scale of OER is a huge piece that has been surfaced over and over again as the most sustainable strategy, right? How do we kind of scale that across the system? And then we also talk about instructional materials is more than textbooks, right? So then uh, how do we expand system level procurement to lower the costs, right, for, uh, for the colleges at the local level so that they can uh, redirect their resources to engage in OER and other ZTC activities? And then we know this uh, sustainability is critical. So how do we engage in the joint advocacy for ongoing investment? So those are some of the key themes uh, from the task force. Next slide, please. And as part of the recommendation, and our board of governors really took action and passed a resolution around burden-free uh, instructional materials. And really uh, the three big uh, 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 pieces that uh, that was highlighted in the resolution uh, really around implementation of uh, the recommendations from the task force. Um, also around, um, sorry, the, the uh, tasks are a little too small for my eyes at this point. Um, really also, you know, ask the chancellor's office uh, to really uh, prioritize and put burden-free access to instructional materials as really a key system priority, right? So how do, we, how do we set it as a key system priority? How do we study the implementation of the task force recommendations to make uh, all these recommendations real, right? And then the last piece, really call on partnership and then focusing on general education courses because we know uh, the impact it will have on equitable student access. Um, next slide, please. 
So with that, I'm going to move into some of those really exciting kind of details around our ZTC degree program. As I mentioned, it's a historic investment of $115 million into the system to develop ZTC degrees and also um, uh, really specifically call out the use of OER in that space, as well as uh, allowing us to give additional dollars for curation of open educational resources. And really the legislative intent has been very clear, which is reduction of the cost of education and decreasing time to completion. Next slide, please. So here's some quick updates. So, uh, you know, huge kudos to my team, uh, James Todd, Chad Funk, and then James Gigi and Michelle. Like we have been really trying to be creative, as creative as we can under the limits of the legislation to create programs in a way that build capacity across our system and really accelerate many of the innovations in the space and fund as many programs as we can, right, within the statutory limit to really grow our OER-based ZTC capacity across the system. So we have created many different grants to make sure to encourage colleges to apply, right? So as you can see, the planning implementation grants are really for every college, because we believe that every college needs to build some kind of capacity in this area. And the acceleration grants are really for uh, colleges that are, have a, a, a very thought out uh, proposal around how they can develop ZTC degrees. And so far we have, we're seeing, you know, we have awarded 424 total programs under the first two grants. And um, you see some numbers there, it's 361 degree programs. And among those 267 are ADT programs. And then we also have 63 certificate programs. And then after that, we have a lot of money left. So this is also, please colleges from the community colleges continue to apply. If you don't know how to apply, call Chad. We're gonna help you to make sure that you apply. Right to get the funding you need, get the support you need to develop the programs and sections for our students. Right, so you can see there are three more uh, grants that are they are ongoing right now. I think we release two of them in April, one of them in July. So all three are active and they're rolling basis. Right, so please apply. Um, as you can see, acceleration two grant is essentially just like the acceleration grant, which is to really support programs that have kind of unique and non duplicative programs. Um, and the impact program is we realize there are many programs that might be duplicative, you know, by appearance and then benefit larger amount of students and we still really need these programs. So how do we continue to partner with the academic Senate right through the coordination cohorts to figure out the common pieces that every college can leverage and then still think about the unique pieces every college needs to develop on their own to build out uh, the program in a way that benefits their students. And then uh, the last piece is OER expansion grant, which allows kind of uh, courses, right? To fund courses in ways to really support, um, to support OER and especially around the GE areas. So as you can see the three newer programs, Acceleration 2, we have awarded uh, six program plans there and OER expansion, we have awarded 13 OER ex uh, uh, expansion grants there. The impact grant in the middle, we're still waiting because as you can see the last kind of little uh, box there, it says leverage materials from coordination cohort. That's really because the statutory requirement of non-duplication, right? So we're still working through that. So we're waiting for these coordination cohorts to conclude and wrap up artifacts, right? For, uh, for the new programs to, to leverage. So, Overall, very, very exciting for us to really see all these programs coming to fruition. And I'm very excited to see these programs turn into sections for our students to really enroll in and, um, uh, you know, really can go to, uh, so then this, you know, I can go to college promise really holds true for all of our students, right? And the last bit is you can see remaining grant funds. So there's still money left. Please, please, please apply. If you have programs, please apply. Next slide, please. So this is, um, we also did a uh, ZTC implementation survey uh, to the colleges. So these are just some, uh, you know, qualitative, uh, well, actually there's, uh, it's quantitative and qualitative really outcomes. So those are some highlights. The prints are really small. So I can definitely provide some, you know, quick highlights there. 
the first one, uh, you know, asked about which strategies are you plan to use to develop your ZTC programs. This is really reaffirming, right? OER as the core strategy for ZTC and rightfully so. And on the left, it, it kind of provides information on sources uh, that currently our system are using to access pre-existing OER materials. You see LibreText and OpenStax are kind of the front runner for the sources there. And then the last one is about whether ZTC has been integrated into institutional effectiveness and uh, equity efforts. So we're seeing it trending in the right direction, but still there's a lot of room for improvement there. So how do institutions treat this as a priority? And I think, you know, through the board resolutions and through um, our continue to, to push in terms of implementation of the task force goals, we're hoping to see these percentages go up. Uh, next slide, please. So then this is also um, another very exciting development for us is when we, uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, as part of the task force uh, recommendations are really thinking about regulatory actions, how to kind of prioritize uh, ZTC and burden-free uh, priorities uh, 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 initiatives across our system. So we are uh, in the process of uh, proposing a regulatory action um, to our board uh, on a burden-free access to instructional materials. So the core, the essence of this regulation essentially to mandate local governing boards to adopt policies to ensure access to instructional materials on the first day of class or before the required use, right, of those materials. And the end of the day to minimize financial administrative burdens for our students. And, um, and then after following that, there's a, a subsequent section really highlight some of those student-centered best practices. What we are really trying to do is for colleges and, and, and districts to think through holistically what are all the resources within their right disposal to support student access there. It's, so it's really important to say, you know, OER is an important strategy. We need to, you know, accelerate that. As you can see, adapting, adopting OER is part of the best practices there. But OER alone cannot get us there to burden free, right? So that's why you see uh, ZTC mentioned there to accelerate and then landing programs, uh, college library resources, financial aid, early disbursement policies, right? Supporting students actually completing their financial aid files so that they can actually get the money, right? And then other direct aids need to also be part of that holistic solution set to support that burden-free uh, priority for our students. Next slide, please. So here's the timeline for the regulation, right? So we went through consultation council. So that's, uh, that's a, a participatory governance process for the community college system. We went through the consultation council. We heard a lot of feedbacks, right? Because this is really about striking that balance of local uh, uh, autonomy and flexibility, as well as uh, systems role, right? To really uh, prioritize burden-free instructional materials. So we, we heard the need to refine that balance. So we went back and changed some languages. We uh, plan to bring uh, the revised language back to consultation council in a few days and then uh, to the Board of Governors for first read, and then uh, potentially the second read in November. And by then, hopefully the Board of Governors will approve it and it becomes, you know, uh, kind of the community college proposal of the recommendations will go through obviously the codification process with the Department of Finance and Secretary of State whatnot. But we're very excited about the movement there to really demonstrate the system's priority uh, and commitment, right, to make uh, acquisition of necessary uh, instructional materials, uh, burden-free for our students. And uh, I don't know how many times I've said it, OER is the way to go. OER has to be the lead strategy for this. Otherwise, it's not feasible or sustainable, right, for the system of our, our size and the funding that we get overall. Next slide, please. So I want to, you know, spend the last uh, few uh, minutes talking about next steps. What we are really focusing on are three pieces around burden-free. One is sustainability, one is equity, and one is innovation. So on the sustainability side, uh, we are really focusing on how do we make sure, right, that the one-time funding of $115 million really has long-lasting impact. So we create all these programs, 
but it's not once and done deal, right? All these materials need to be updated, needs to be maintained. So how do we continue to support resource development there around sustainability? How do we continue to explore, right? OER repository that maintains OER content and then also facilitate adaptation and remixing of materials. And then, you know, we also, as you can see, we have some remaining funding there. So we wanna to continue to think creatively. Are there flexibility in any way, right? We can generate to then direct some of these fundings to partner with strong, you know, uh, you know, with strong partners like ASCCC to continue to think about what the needs are for our system in the long term. And the second piece around equity is, you know, what I'm thinking about is kind of professional development, right? around open anti-racist pedagogy, universal design, accessibility, compliance. You know, how do we really think about, you know, supporting faculty in doing that kind of work and alleviating also burdens on their end, right? To worry about that kind of stuff. And how do we continue to seek uh, opportunities to adapt these existing OER, right? To include more student identified, uh, affirming inclusive content. So how do we bring students into this conversation, empower uh, student voice and, and choice? And the last bit around innovation, you know, a big part of that is AI. How do we continue to think about, you know, AI in this space, the future of AI? How do we think about that for student learning analytics? And how do we, uh, you know, ensure we support culturally relevant learning authentic assessment methods, right? And then also when you think about, you know, earlier I talked about the special populations we want to focus on, how do we think about the relationship between, uh, you know, OER and in distance education to make sure that education is more flexible and accessible for all of our students. So I'm going to end my presentation there. Um, and then I think, Michelle, is this the time for us to kind of jointly answer questions? Absolutely, yeah. So if people um, have questions, they want to raise their hand and um, and speak up, or if they want to put questions in the chat. Um, we did have question um, a question about data on the financial impact or cost uh, savings associated with the funds that have been um, awarded already. Um, I think that's where that was going. Um, and I don't think you have that at this point. <laughs> I think that's something way out there. Um, so if anyone Michelle, has questions, yeah, go ahead, Chad. Yeah, Michelle, that will be a part of our progress uh, reports that we'll be working on that will come out towards the end of the year. So we'll be collecting data on uh, really the status of the work that many colleges have done to this point. Some colleges have courses um, within those programs of study that have become um, active. And so we will start to collect the data on that. And that is anticipating to continue to grow. So we don't have that quite yet, but we should have that hopefully early next spring, at least our initial um, indicators as, as courses become um, converted to ZTC as those conversions take place um, and get a better sense of, of, of how much cost savings we're getting uh, within the system. Great. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, Michelle, go ahead and unmute yourself and speak. Yes, so I reached out to Michelle and Chad and Rebecca with this question, and I was awarded a grant from a community college, uh, Mount San Antonio Community College, to adapt or adopt an OER textbook. And I've been using something that I created two years ago, which is Canvas Pages, based on three different resources for physical geography. So what I did with this grant money was um, to further adapt and adopt this uh, textbook that I've been using is I'm using AI to create basically quiz questions for quiz banks, both short answer and uh, multiple choice. And I also have found a converter through this meeting here on how to summarize a YouTube video and then create multiple choice questions from that. So it's um, not a formative assessment. It's really a summative assessment type tool, but it's something that I think would make the adoption of OER textbooks more attractive to, to, to professors because this is Canvas ready and their QTI files, they'll load right up into the uh, Canvas system as a quiz. And then the way I use them in my classes is that it's iterative. The students can take it as many times as they want. So they're getting, I call them knowledge checks. My question is, would it be appropriate to apply for one of the types of grants you've mentioned? Or, you know, how should I pursue getting other opportunities to create this for textbooks? 
I can get started, but uh, I feel like Chad and I, we can, I mean, I can't, I can't, you know, have side conversation with Chad here. So I'm going to go out of limb. So Chad, definitely correct me. So I will say from the chancellor's office level, I would say what you uh, provide is then eligible for the grant per se, right? Because the, the statute is very uh, prescriptive in terms of you, you know, only uh, programs, right? Only kind of uh, commitment to develop a full DTC degree program will be funded in those grants or a course, curation of course. But once that goes to a college, right? then college has a lot more flexibility in how they engage in different vendors to create and develop uh, these, these programs. Okay, so it would, it would be the next tier down, not these grants, but the, the ones who are successful in getting these grants might want this kind of functionality. That's, that's, that's correct. And also, you know, for us, as we continue to think about and um, that's a piece, you know, from the chancellor's office, we can start to think about also curation of like support, you know, potential supports and tools out there, maybe start to curate that. So college can start to look at, okay, here are all the potential, right, uh, tools out there, they're helpful. And, and then they can get to make a more informed decisions around, you know, who and how to engage. Great. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, Ying. Hi. Um, sorry, my internet is a little bit unstable. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, all three of you, for the update. And um, I think lastly, in Leslie's update, uh, she was actually talking about the cool for ad. And uh, so Chad and James Gigi has been giving some update about the collaboration between the CCC system and the CSU system and you know whatever comes out of the, the ZTC funding, um, you know, the resources will go on uh cool for ad. I was wondering if um, Rebecca or Leslie uh, or Chad, if you guys can elaborate on that, uh, that collaboration. Go ahead, Chad. Well, uh, first, let me, uh, I'll just say, and if I can, shameless plug, but I really could not ask for a better partner than Leslie and Barbara Sperling from the CSU office, who have been working with us to help support um, the developments around this area, as well as feedback from several uh, individuals, including Michelle and uh, Michelle Pilati and uh, James Gigi around this project. What we're working on right now is uh, we, we've met, we've worked on a lot of the metadata information that needs to be taken into the system. Um, and what we are working on right now is a synergistic um, process that would uh, allow institutions to have a template that they're able to complete, uh, provide information within that template, and then it would be able to be uploaded into, um, into the Cool for Ed area. We're, we're trying to work on a portal uh, that'll be specific to the community colleges on the Cool for Ed site that will help to uh, capture that information, um, provide some assurances uh, at the time that, that we have collect that data and then hopefully with work and a lot of work really on the CSUs. And please note, the CSUs were not funded to, to do this within the ZTC degree grant program. They were literally doing this um, out of that collaborative heart that you heard Leslie talk about, that desire to serve intersegmentally um, all three of our systems and then beyond really, uh, even internationally. Um, and so the work that they have done with us to help guide uh, this, this particular process so the colleges can submit something that a consuming format, format is good. We are expecting probably within the next few weeks, Leslie, if I'm not, if I'm not too far off, to have a beta um, of that process. And then as soon as, as we, we can basically test and make sure that we don't have bugs uh, in that process, we will uh, hold more than likely probably time at our ZTC office hour as well as a webinar to share out how that information can be shared specific to the ZTC degree grant program. For the resources that need to be placed into Cool for Ed. So we're making good progress. Um, but again, I cannot reiterate the amount of how much I appreciate uh, Leslie and her team. They have been fantastic in this help. So uh, that's it from the from our side. Leslie, any from from you? Yeah, we're all in this together and we're wanting to make it work. So does that answer your question, Ying? Yes, thank you. Sure. Thanks for asking it. And reach out anytime if you have anything else, if you have any suggestions, et cetera. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Chad.
Are there questions? We've got a whole five minutes left. <laughs> Or four, you can and you, you can feel free to put questions in the chat if you'd prefer not to not to speak. All right, I can't read the chat without glasses. Uh, what does the panel panel recommend to OER advocates to convince administrators this is the way to go? Great question. Well, I'll just jump in really fast. Um, it is a great question and it's challenging at times depending on where the strategies are going or headed or focused on at the institution. Um, one way is to include uh, incorporate the strategic plan and how uh, low cost, zero cost course materials strategy is going to support the campus or the institution's plan. It could also point up to what the community college chancellor's office is doing. For example, I'm assuming you're at the community college, sorry, Cecilia. If not, um, wherever those strategic plans are, that's a one way to align with those. Um, and then really to whatever initiatives are uh, focused on student success, student social justice, student equity, um, all of those aspects are, are usually compelling as well. And then, you know, just uh, including students in some of these discussions. A lot of times if you have student academic, student senates, um, which we, we do, and I'm, I'm pretty sure the other two systems do as well, uh, we speak with them often and, and get their support as well. So that's my two cents. I mean, there are other ways to do this, but that's just a few things off the top of my head. I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Thanks, um, Leslie. I think about, I think sometimes I think people do believe OER is the strategy, but I think uh, it's often treated as like a thing, right? So like I pay for OER, I invest in OER and I'm done. I think really the conversation is to, uh, I will say, you know, in many ways educate and support our legislators to understand OER is a very cost-effective strategy, but it's a sustainable, there needs to be a sustainability play Right, so this is an ongoing effort to support it. And I think another piece is, uh, I think uh, really the understanding around the long-term gain and sometimes the short-term gratification of like you're able to negotiate, right, on the cost of textbooks and you think that's already a win, but really thinking long-term, right? So I think laying out kind of the, 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 the comparison in the longer term, I think will tell a, a very different story, right? And Rebecca, if I could add in as well, there uh, on the on the at one uh, training areas, our technical assistance provider at a College of the Canyons has a series of um, of courses that are available, um, Cecilia, that can help um, not with administrators but also other departments potentially on your on your college or at your university that might be of a challenge. And one of those is making the case for ZTC Pathways to Equity. That particular course um, has. Um, really does lay out a good case as to why OER is such a positive way to go, what, uh, specifically uh, OER inside of ZTC. But I, I would recommend if you need some of that uh, information, if you're outside of the CCC system, uh, if you reach out to myself, email me or um, one of our colleagues here, we'll try to get you in contact with King and see if we can try to get that information uh, to you. Because I do think even just looking through some of that information and understanding that once people can have some time to sit with it, it can be really helpful. And that's laid out in a very nice training module. I think it's four weeks. Only thing I would add is student success data, I think is really important to all the UC campuses. And so when we're able to share the outcomes from classes that are using OER as compared to previously, that has been our best strategy. Okay, I think we are um, exactly at time. So um, thank you all very, very much. And we'll, we have a few minutes before the next session. So thank you so much to our uh, three presenters. It's great to sort of see what the systems are doing all at the same time. 
um, and look forward to hopefully doing this again uh, next year. So thank you everyone and have a good rest of your day.